bobblehead. You got one of my bobbleheads? I do. You gave it to me a while ago. I asked for it. You did. <laughs> I love it. All right. So, do you want to sit here while I read the story? Sure. All right. I don't know if you've heard this one before. If you if you haven't, try not to give it away. Okay. And as I read, try not to slurp your tea. Be quiet. But don't don't, don't sit absolutely still. That would be weird because okay. it's going to take about five minutes. Oh. But don't get so involved that it's disruptive to me. I guess I can sit that long. <laughs> Normally, I just would never. I, I would wait, but I'm, I'm trying to establish what they call a continuity. Mm -hmm. I want people to know that every Saturday morning they can join me for a cup of coffee, and sometimes there'll be an occasional guest. Yeah, and that's I you. always join you on Saturday morning. See, you're in good company. Um, okay, then I'm going to read this. Okay. This is called the in-laws on the outs. And don't read over my shoulder, okay. and don't slurp your tea, okay. and no sudden movements, but relax and be casual. <laughs> Here it is. The Millers knew that Loring Johnson would be the perfect son-in-law, bright, handsome, ambitious, and best of all, Methodist. So when Loring proposed to their oldest daughter, the Millers rejoiced, because they knew they were getting more than a son-in-law. They were getting a Johnson. T.C. Schnebly, on the other hand, was another story. Like Johnson, Schnebly had fallen for one of the Miller girls. But unlike Johnson, Schnebly was not the kind of son-in-law that Phil and Amanda had in mind. You simply can't marry a Schnebly, said Amanda. He's a Presbyterian. Indeed, said Philip. What will the townspeople say? Turns out, the townspeople said quite a bit, and none of it was very nice. Philip Miller's getting a hundred son-in-laws, they said. Loring is a one, and Schnebly a double zero. Go ahead. Nowadays, true love might be non-denominational, but back in 1901, the Methodists of Gorin, Missouri, found themselves surrounded by encroaching Lutherans, Baptists, Episcopalians, and Presbyterians. So, even though their daughter said, I do, the Millers said, we don't, and young Mr. Schnebly found himself at odds with his new in-laws. For nearly four years, he tried to win them over, but nothing could assuage their disappointment or temper their disdain. Ultimately, Amanda Miller shunned her own daughter, and the pain and strife became too much to bear. With two small children, the Schneblys yearned for a more peaceful existence. They dreamed of a quiet place, a place of solitude. And beauty. But where? One day, T.C. received a letter from his brother, raving about a faraway place of unsurpassed tranquility. Ellsworth Schnebly was a frail man and required a climate that suited his weak condition. Apparently, he'd found it. A lush, verdant canyon in the high desert with clean air and a fast-running mountain brook surrounded by breathtaking buttes and monoliths. The Schneblys fled Gorn with all due speed. After connecting with Ellsworth, T.C. homesteaded 80 pristine acres and quickly fell in love. There was something magnetic about the place, something magical about the way the canyon glowed in the evening sun. The Schneblys built a stone house nestled in a grove of cottonwoods, tucked into the gentle bend of a winding creek. But that's not all they built. You see, the Schneblys believed that others would be equally enchanted by the strange beauty of their new surroundings. So T.C. built a ten-room way station in the middle of nowhere. His neighbors might have called him crazy, but T.C. didn't have any neighbors. So he built a road that ran all the way to Flagstaff. And sure enough, the people started to come. They came for dinner and stayed for the night, luxuriating in the tranquility of the quiet canyon. And marveling at the serenity. One day it occurred to T.C. that his guest might extend their stay if they could send and receive mail from his little bed and breakfast, so T.C. applied for a post office permit. After many weeks, T.C. got a response from Washington, D.C. Dear Mr. Schnebly, it read, we are happy to set up a post office in your home, but regret to inform you that Schnebly Station is too large to fit in the cancellation stamp. Please select a shorter name for consideration. T.C. read the letter to Ellsworth, 
His brother said, why not name the post office after your wife? TC turned to his wife and said, how would you like a post office named after you? Mrs. Schnebly smiled as TC wrote her first name into the space provided. And a few weeks later, the tiny desert community in the middle of nowhere had its very own post office named after the wife of Theodore Carlton Schnebly, a young woman ostracized by her own mother and driven from her home by the kind of discord and strife that can only result from marrying a Presbyterian. It's ironic because the town that eventually grew up around Schnebly's little bed and breakfast would adopt that very same name, a name now synonymous with tranquility and peace and spiritual healing. It's enough to make you wonder if the U.S. Post Office had used a smaller font back in 1902, would people be traveling from all over the world to experience the strange and abiding peace of Schnebly Station? Or if the Millers had welcomed TC into their family all those years ago, would people today be talking about the mystical wonders of magnetic vortexes that still surround the Schnebly home? We'll never know, because today, those who seek enlightenment and the metaphysical glow of those now famous red rocks do so in a town whose name was concocted by a mother who pulled six letters from thin air and gave them to a daughter she would ultimately disown, a daughter named Sedona. I want one more thing on the subject of irony. Remember Loring Johnson, the perfect son-in-law who pleased the Millers with his every word and deed? Yeah, he went to Leavenworth. The details of his incarceration are inconsequential, but he died in custody, bringing great shame to Millers, Methodists, and Johnsons everywhere. Anyway, I'm Mike Rowe, and... That's the way I heard it. Good. You like it? I did. And I've heard it before, but a long time ago. From me? Yeah. That's because what I do is I post them over on the podcast right. at micro.com slash podcast. Mm -hmm. And then weeks later, here, because people seem to like it, I sit down with my coffee and I reread them again, thus creating what many have said. It is an entirely new experience. Maybe I could come every Saturday and sit with you. Would you like that? That <laughs> sounds great. Of course. Um, you can stay as long as you want. You'll be leaving with one of these, an original Lindsay yes. doll. Lovely parting yes, gift. I do love it. And uh, if you'd like one, um, you'll be encouraged right now to overbid dramatically in the coming week for this, uh, as well as my purloined bathrobe from the, what's the name of the hotel again? Oceana. I was testing it. It's great. So a bathrobe and a piece of original art in the uh, likeness of my dog. What'd you think? It was fun? Yeah, it was fun. It's going to be great. Yeah, I do love it. And, I, will be excited. and I'm going to uh, I'm going to read your book this weekend. Okay. My mom's written a book. She just sent it to me. I'm going to read it. I can't wait to see. I hope it's good. I swear I can't bring myself to to tell you it's not. I know, but I want you to be honest. I know, but I mean I know it's going to be good. But if it's not, would how do I handle it if it's not great? Just, well, just tell me that it's good, but it could be even better if I spend a little more time on it. But I think it's ready. This is the kind of honesty my mom and I have always enjoyed. It's going to be great. I can't wait. And, and then we'll get it published, and then we'll auction it off, and it'll be good. <laughs> Any final thoughts before I hit end? No, but this was fun. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. And when are you leaving again? 